A lot of you pastors, just knock yourself out trying to grow the church and minister and shepherd and do all the things with good hearts. God calls you to pray. God calls you to spend your days hanging around him. And out of the overflow, he ministers in an astonishing way and he adds to his church. He does astonishing things when we learn to depend upon him. I have a workshop that I do. How prayer can make your ministry more effective. Now, I believe that with all my heart, pastors. I, I know that, that in, in our overwhelmed age, all the things we have to do, I know that prayer can literally take everything you have to do and make it more effective, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I also know that prayer brings people to Jesus. I do a lot of teaching on prayer evangelism. I have a personal opinion. I can't prove it to you right now, but you look me up in heaven and I'll prove it to you. How's that for a deal? Okay. I don't believe anybody ever came to Jesus till someone somewhere first prayed for them. Okay. Someone somewhere prayed for you before you came to Jesus and that released the Holy Spirit's work to draw you to him. Jesus said, no one, no one, no one ever has, no one ever will. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. Okay. I believe prayer is critical to evangelism. And I tell you, it's exciting when you look around the world and, and the fact is where the church is praying the most, the church is growing the most. Phenomenal things are happening around the planet. We hear about oh, how Islam is growing. I want to tell you, Christianity is outstripping Islam everywhere. Astonishing things are happening. You just don't hear about it. But it's happening not typically in the United States and Canada and certainly not in Europe. It's happening among our brothers and sisters in Christ who often do not have our buildings, our resources, our television, our radio, all the things we think we have to have. Poor people, all they have is prayer. And God releases his power to draw whole villages to Jesus because of praying Christians. I'm not going to talk about that. You see, what I just need to say very simply is this. When the church prays, we demonstrate clearly to God that we're depending upon him. And when we do not pray, we demonstrate clearly to God that we really don't need him. You see, it's that simple. There's a lot of other teachings you understand on prayer, stacks of seminars that I'd love to teach. But today, we need to understand that the fact that we are not a house of prayer in reality is an affront to the living God. We, his people, we who are called by his name, basically have said to God, we're going to pray and open our services. And we're going to close our services. We use prayer simply as kind of a functional thing. Move people around, do things in prayer. We've got to ask the question in our own congregations, and then I'll let you fuss with it in your own life. Who are we depending on? Based on the amount of prayer that you, <clears throat> that you know takes place, <clears throat> excuse me, in your congregation, who are you depending on? To get things done, to make decisions, to change things, to impact a culture, to bring people to Jesus, Who's doing it? And the fact of the matter is we are. And, and I really, 
I want you to understand, I think the Lord, in his grace and mercy, often stands back and kind of folds his arms and says, this is fascinating. I just, I just, I'm in amazement. What do you think, son? Look at this. And I think they have conversations about those who, listen to me, really do love him. They really do. And in fact, are those who are going to heaven. But are convinced that they can do the work of God in their own strength. Look, it isn't that hard. I'm absolutely, absolutely convinced. I can take a very personable pagan and show him how to grow a megachurch. Absolutely convinced of that. And I'm not saying that against megachurches because I can show him how to grow a church of 100 even easier. We can, we can do some good things for God. But we can't do anything that lasts. We can't do anything that's going to change the world. We can't do anything that has eternal impact. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I know that. I've proven that to be true. I've done a lot of nothing for him. I've done a lot of stuff on my own strength that had no impact beyond what I could see. It was not going to have the fruit that lasts. It's real simple. When we pray, we tell God and the world we're depending on him. We can't do it without him. And when we don't pray, we say, thanks. If, if we need you, we'll call. The early church, the book of Acts, is a model of people who had listened to Jesus about prayer and who watched Jesus pray. And without most of what you and I have, within their lifetime, they turned the world upside down. And that's going to have to happen in our day. And it won't happen from just harder work or better methods or better training. It's going to come because we pray. It's going to happen because we've learned to depend upon him. Who are you depending on? Are you by much prayer leaning upon the Lord and his power? Or are you stealing God's glory by trying to do his work in your strength? The house of prayer, the den of thieves, we steal his glory. The heart cry for revival is a cry of desperation. It is the cry of complete dependence. There is nobody I know here among leadership who believes that we can somehow organize and work and bring about a revival. What we can do is learn to turn from ourselves. Repent of our sins. Cry out in desperation. Learn to depend upon him and create, as someone said, a landing strip for the Holy Spirit to come and to change us forever. Without prayer, there is no repentance. And without repentance, there is no revival. I'm going to say something that's very difficult to say to a group of people who are passionate about revival. But my friends, given the prayer life of the church, at least in America today, for God to send a revival would amount to him endorsing our independent prayerless lifestyles. And I don't say that in any way to feel good it brings me grief. We're desperate for revival. We've got to have revival. And it's not going to happen to a prayerless church. Now, 
I don't mean that every church has to have this. I don't mean that all of our, our, our uh, prayer services are full. That happens typically in a response to revival. But there's got to be that remnant of people who are crying out. There's got to be a growing awareness in the church of Jesus Christ that we can't do it ourselves and we desperately need the power of God to come. Let me just, I want to close. Some of you know, my closings sometimes take a while. Relax. (laughs) But let me say this. You cannot, you cannot by yourself go back and change your church into a house of prayer. I can't give you 10 easy steps on how to do that. But here's what you can do. You can leave this place. Actually, I'll tell you, you can leave this room today filled with the zeal of God for his house. I told you beginning, that's, that's all I'm asking. No, I'm not even asking it. It's what I believe the Spirit of God is asking of us all today. That we, we be filled with the kind of zeal we see in our Lord and Savior for the house of God. There are some things I think you can do. You can begin to pray for a spirit of prayer to come upon you and upon your congregation. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it speaks of a time in which a spirit of grace and supplication, that's prayer, will be poured out on a whole city. It shows us at least that that's something that God does, that that's one of the ways that he, he works in pouring out a whole spirit of prayer. I didn't understand that. I'd read it until uh, I visited probably 11, 12 years ago uh, the Brooklyn Tabernacle congregation. And uh, uh, Daniel was talking about that church last night. And it's a church that is a house of prayer. It, it really is. Oh, they're still growing in it. They still have ways to go. There's still a lot of things they want to change. But, but they pray at a, at a deep level. Interesting enough, as we watched uh, all the things were going on, it was all exciting, all the stuff, and going up to their prayer room, it's going 24 hours a day, filled with people who are praying, and you know, those of us who are prayer people really were excited, and there was a group of denominational prayer leaders there, and uh, we saw all this, and then we went and met with their staff, and they let us ask questions about how all this happened, and someone asked the question, well, tell us how it all began. And one of the guys who've been on staff from, from the very beginning of all of this happening said, well, we, uh, we just asked God to send a spirit of prayer. And we all wrote that down. So no, that's good. That's good, spirit of prayer. But now, now what did you do, though, to go beyond that to, to get this thing organized and things? Because you see, we're all prayer people type thing, organizers, mobilizers. And, and, and the same guy on staff, he said, well, you know, to be honest, we just, we just kept praying for a spirit of prayer. Oh, they don't write that down. They kept praying for a spirit of prayer. <laughs> then it was my turn, and I, Grace, I said, now, I, I hear that, but now tonight, uh, on Tuesday night, I know that we're going to be having this great, great prayer meeting, and thousands of people are going to be here. Who's, uh, who is planning that for tonight? I mean, how is this going to happen tonight for this? And one of the other pastors just smiled and he says, we're just asking God for a spirit of prayer. (laughs) I kind of went, oh, they're asking for a spirit of prayer. Nothing slow about this guy. You understand, even prayer people, we can start looking for techniques and methods. And to be honest, there there are methods there. I'm I'm not ignoring the fact. They they do certain things that are good and wise in, in what they do. But they were trying to teach us in a not-so-subtle way. This comes from the heart of God. It's a gift of God, and you've got to ask for it. We've got to be crying out for a spirit of prayer, not just in our congregations, but in us. You can start prayer meetings in your home. You can choose to attend as many prayer meetings as you can find in your, in your church, in your, in your community. You can support and encourage community prayer events. In a month, we're going to have the National Day of Prayer. 35,000 prayer events happening all over the United States. Why wouldn't you go to one of those? 
what would be a possible reason for someone passionate about revival in this nation to not show up? Shirley Dobson, our chairman, has asked every one of those events to include prayers of repentance on behalf of our nation. You could do that. You can pray with greater levels of passion, especially focused on intimacy with Christ, on evangelism, on revival, on the return of Jesus. But today, today, would you join me in asking God to make you a house of prayer. Houses of prayer are contagious. People of prayer infect others. It does not grow so much by method as by the working of the Spirit of God in one Christian who carries with them something of the zeal of Jesus for the house of God. I want to tell you a principle that I learned years ago. And I find a lot of people don't know this one. You got to pray about prayer. You got to pray about prayer. I got to tell you, I'm not spiritual enough to be a man of prayer. I'm just not. But every day, every day, God, would you make me a man of prayer? I need you to do something in me if I'm going to love to pray. God, would you do something in me? Because I don't want to pray. I want to go watch Butler get beat. I didn't pray enough. I never pray about a basketball game. It's just not important enough. I could pray for my meal, but those things are irrelevant. You've got to pray about prayer. Jesus said to us through the word of God, and I believe he says it to us today through the word, you do not have because you do not ask. You are not a house of prayer because you've not asked to be. You are not a man or woman of prayer because you've not asked to be. You are not filled with zeal for the house of God because you've not asked for that. Now, when you ask for that, by the way, you still have to cooperate with what God does. When his spirit begins to stir within you a desire to pray, you have to say, yes. When others ask you to pray, you have to say, yes. But you gotta keep asking. I believe the revival is coming. I'm believing God for a worldwide revival. I'm praying for one that touches South Africa and Germany and Canada. But the responsibility God has placed in my life is for the nation in which I live. And for most of you who live here in the US, you have a responsibility to pray for revival here. I believe it's coming but it happens not to a church that looks like it does today. Not to a church that stopped its prayer meetings. Not to a church that looks at, pr at prayer as merely a functionary sort of thing, a way to open and close meetings. But to the people of God who begun to line up with Jesus with a zeal for the house of God and an anger that rises up, not at people, but it's the very situation in which we find the house of prayer being everything except that. And we've got to allow 
Spirit of God today in us. You begin to make us into something that we weren't when we walked in here. Zeal for God's house has consumed me. Would you be able to walk out of here saying that? We're going to have a song of worship. Josh is going to come and just just lead us in that. I don't know. Um, I don't know the best way for you to do this. I know. I got to tell you, I've not preached this one before. And God's been dealing with me for weeks on this. If you can't tell, I'm passionate about prayer. But I had never grabbed a hold of the zeal that Jesus had for the house of prayer and begun to apply it to my life until these last few weeks. And it has driven me to my knees. And I'm just wondering whether it's going to drive you to your knees. I don't know whether that means that you're going to come up here and pray or whether you drop to your knees where you are. Maybe you need to sit where you are. But it's time for zeal, for his house to consume us, for us to line our lives up with Jesus. Oh God, would you do it today in us? Lord, I don't know that there'll be any difference in my emotions with this or whether you simply put something deep within me that says forevermore, Lord. I will be a person of prayer. I will have zeal for your house. I will make this a matter of passionate prayer all of my days. Lord, whatever you do, I invite you, Lord, here now in this place. Make us a house of prayer. Give each of us, deep within us, a zeal to see your house become all that you desire it to be. We ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. 